I'm Sonia Bue. I'm a white middle-aged woman wearing pink tra translucent rimmed glasses and my hair is covered. I'm extremely honoured to be invited to speak at this IJade conference on the vital subject of belonging. All my life I felt like an outsider and sometimes I'm made to feel other. Statistically speaking, I'm a neurological minority and I belong to a group which has been historically stigmatized. As I speak, you might notice my liking for inverted commas. Perhaps because we often perform inverted commas, it is grammar I have seen and therefore I can absorb. I use them in this context because autism stigma is prejudice by another name. In preparing my talk, I've come to an extremely useful realization. If like me, you can't absorb most of the rules of grammar, it pays to write in short sentences. After a lifetime of misplaced punctuation, less is definitely more. My talk is therefore quite meta. In writing as myself, I challenge the neurological hegemony, the neuromajority, and reassert my belonging. Today I will talk about my practice as research. I'll also talk about the impact of the written and spoken word in erecting barriers and perpetuating inequality in the visual arts through intellectual ableism. We rely on words to signify meaning, yet they can be inaccessible. Paradoxically, I must use words to express this thought and very often it is assumed my brain can work in a linear and sequential fashion. This is the kind of cognitive bias I want to poke a stick at, on behalf of those of us who think in layers and associations. For neuromajority people, it may be difficult to comprehend that the strictures of linearity can be painful and the inability to follow sequence is not willful inattention. I will therefore present a series of fragments, interrelated thoughts and experiences that demonstrate moments of insight brought about through practice research. A note about practice research. What kind of maker am I? And what do I mean by practice research? I'm curious and analytical by nature. Investigating ideas through the use of materials is intuitive and a method. My training in experiential art therapy provides me with a methodology and a framework for practice. I allow myself to be led by materials and process, and I'm used to taking what's often called a leap in the dark. And actually, this is a neurological necessity. If you're a cup half full person, you might call such moments leaps of faith. And I've learned to have faith in my native navigational methodology. My neurological orientation is to think with my hands. Abstract concepts are uninteresting and inaccessible. If I haven't seen or held something, I generally can't grasp it in my mind, and I'm not sure it's real. Not knowing is often an abrupt and visceral sensation. I think of this as a data void, and whether it's disabling or presents a creative opportunity is down to context and environment. I sometimes feel I'm on the edge of a cliff and I have to ask myself, should I stand back? Should I leap? Will I fall? From my perspective, practice research emerges as a means to fill the data void. In the absence of meaningful data that I can hold, see or process, I must create data of my own. And this is often in the form of art. In the act of making, I become knowledgeable. In the act of making, I become. Manifesting lived experience through this making is the mainstay of my research, with a focus on neuroinclusivity and communication.
artist, writer, maker. For me, everything's connected. As a concrete thinker, I rely on muscle memory. I rely on the physical traces of my thoughts and actions. I require physical engagement with the material world to organize my thoughts. I will give you an example. Thoughts scatter and misbehave. I loop constantly to the top of the page to keep track of what I've just written. I want to share a vivid memory of an early writing process involving scissors, sellotape, and highlighter pens. My university days consisted of hacking the demands of academic study for my unsuitable brain. Unsuitable. <laughs> I would lay pages of typing across the floor and cut, shuffle, rearrange and sellotape the words. These elongated word assemblages were neatly typed a second or third time to hand in to my unsuspecting tutors. Somehow, this object has remained in my possession, and I love the typewriter that first released me from the nightmare of handwriting. It's even featured in some of my projects and films. I remember the realisation that type was so very much easier to read than my handwriting, and that the clack of the keys helped me focus. I passed as normal. I even got good grades. But what was the cost of all my extra labour? And for all that I appeared neurotypical, I knew I didn't belong. Good grades signified that grades were rubbish. And if I could win at this game, then the prize must be a dud. A further note about writing. Writing also helps fill the data void. A recent chapter for Neurodivergence and Architecture, Volume 5, Elsevier Academic Press, 2022, has contributed to what feels like a moment of arrival. The chapter incorporates blog posts written for my Arts Council England NUNO project, which took place between 2018 and 2019. It's called Not All Surfaces Catch the Light at the Same Time. Out of sheer necessity, I made what feels like a breakthrough. I was up against a final deadline, and with no other remedy, I wrote a stream of consciousness and somehow met the mark in record time. I wrote neurodivergently, and my writing was accepted. This has unstoppered a cork. It has revealed a hidden secret. The struggle to structure text is about masking my autism. My struggle to accommodate an imaginary reader I can never hope to comprehend. Word assemblages and endless looping to the top of the page have been a form of masking. I didn't know what I didn't know and it took an act of faith that my readers, in this case my editors, would welcome me as myself. Surely all learners deserve such a welcome. I'll read you an excerpt from my chapter. Back then, I was another person. I mentioned this to explain any possible duplication of fact contained in Not All Surfaces Catch the Light and this brief introduction. It does all feel very distant. Also, don't we often repeat ourselves when telling our story? Besides, back then, there was no COVID-19. And nothing, not even our trust in factual information, has been the same since COVID-19. And furthermore, I need to arrange the facts in a different order, looking backwards. If facts are a bit like objects, which I feel they might be, this makes sense as arranging ideas like objects is something of a theme and a necessity. I think this is because what we call working memory is in short supply. And when you are a person of short attention span, my mother's take on things 
you need objects, I find. Portals of memory. Objects can do so much of the heavy lifting where mapping and keeping track are concerned. It has also been said that my kind of people, or perhaps people like me, are concrete thinkers. I feel this is good information, which helps me keep away from abstract cognitions. Yes, what follows is an exercise in trying to hold on to complex ideas using concrete thinking. For me, this is writing neurodivergently. I remind myself that such breakthroughs are only partly accidental. I have a body of writing to draw on and I've edged towards this breakthrough in countless blog posts and articles, each one being another act of faith. It strikes me that my discovery is again quite meta. I could be open and unmask my autism in my writing, but the hidden enemy was form. It takes many a leap to unpick a lifetime of alien and unhelpful learning, it seems. A note about speaking and the assumption of speech. Today, I'm a speaker, but speech is not a given. I'd like to give some thought to speakers who speak differently, those who experience wordlessness and non-speakers. Our diverse orientations and communication preferences are often ignored, and this is both ableist and seems quite illogical for the visual arts. Visual culture is overly wordy, I think, and we need to topple all assumptions about speech. Those of us who experience situational mutism, non-speakers, and those who speak differently, need environments that are genuinely open and welcoming. The absence of welcome and the intimidation of a range of non-speakers requires urgent redress. My own journey with speech provides a powerful example of practice research in action. Cultural spaces have often appeared encoded and unreflective, and question practices about speaking are ubiquitous and also excluding. Who speaks, what is said, and to whom turns out to be more complex than I ever imagined. Before my autism diagnosis, I didn't know the cause of my bewildering inarticulacy outside of a tight circle of trust etched on my consciousness as a shameful secret and a personal failing. My situational mutism, as I now know it to be, is revealed as a byproduct of intellectual ableism, in which the assumption of speech is the overriding norm. In 2015, under pressure to speak about my practice, I stumbled on a solution. Alone in my studio, I taught myself to speak by manipulating sand, which I was working with in relation to a family history of internment in French concentration camps. I had developed a fascination with sand and was using it as a medium across forms. If I closed my eyes while I ran, ran my fingers through it, I found I could talk quite fluently into my iPhone I had discovered a neural pathway in the privacy of my studio. With the aid of an accessible and non-judgmental piece of digital technology. Most importantly, I was in control. I had found a place of safety and the means to take another leap in the dark. I'm going to show a very, very short video. This short video shows repeated tiled footage of the artist Sonia Bua's hand manipulating sand. As I speak, my hands are in the sand. And when I'm touching the sand, I can talk 
very fluently which is something I can't do if I have to look at other people or be thinking oh my god I have to make sense and these words have to hook together as I'm talking now my eyes are closed I'm squeezing the sand it feels fluent through these means I have seemingly joined those who can speak alongside the written word the ability to speak about my practice has been game-changing for my career but this is not to be taken as a story of individual triumph over adversity the issues are structural and I'm also still frequently overwhelmed and wordless when I'm unable to process events in real time. I have found a way to speak in certain contexts in a profession that assumes and demands speech as a given, but this only goes so far. My hack kicks the can down the road and defers subsequent layers of exclusion. A note about presence. Practice research has brought about a revolution within me. After a lifetime of hard labour, I no longer consider it my job to accommodate the neuromajority. In June 2022, I was selected to join a research trip to Documenta 15 with an extraordinary group of UK-based disabled artists and curators. This experience enabled me to further deconstruct the embedded neuronormative ableism within the rituals and practices of the art world. So pervasive and so deeply rooted is this bias that I caught myself playing along, politely and passively camouflaging my bewilderment and incomprehension. An overwhelming assumption of neurotypicality, the idea that we can all understand process and conform to the prevailing social norms, demanded a performance of presence while negating it. Cue psychological whiplash. A lifetime of social conditioning had me colluding with my own exclusion, but performing presence is not the same as being present. As at school, in so many cultural spaces, I've been there, but not there. I've fragmented, glazed, floated, and focused on nodding and smiling in the right places. An adaptive survivalist practice, which avoids more overt exclusions and harms. This is a low bar for participation, and it is certainly not belonging. A note on neurodiversity. I want to close by reading extracts from a recent article for the British Art Network called Oddments and Fever Dreams, Notes from the Field, 2012 to 2022. COVID puts you off everything. The term neurodivergent is suddenly aversive and I can't look at a tomato. This helps me recall how long it took to get used to the word in the first place. It gives me even more sympathy for those who get confused or simply prefer to say, quite wrongly in terms of grammar, that they are neurodiverse. The language about us is far too complicated. I tell myself that I don't have to love it. I also have a recurring doubt. From my perspective, it's other people who are different, making them divergent. Touché. I'm hyperlogical. I love how most people act like they don't have a brain, by which I mean it's not the first thing on their minds. Some of us don't have that luxury, but we do all have a brain. The rest is numbers and things called norms. Diverging from a norm is, by definition, a minority pursuit, which is how I came to be neurodivergent. Unbeknownst to me until quite late in life, fewer people think like me or approach the world as I do, 
due to their neurological difference. Who knew? People can be illogical, sometimes foolhardy, and often inconsistent. Now I understand that they are neurotypical and can't help it. By definition, these people are in the majority. Some people prefer to use the terms neuromajority and neuro minority. I like this too. <laughs>